We spoke about the future of trade policy in the previous panel, and now we will turn to another one, uh, to the elephant in the room, as the Minister for Industry, Mr. Sikela, has said, which is energy. There can't be life without energy, and there certainly can't be uh, an economy if you left out energy from the equation. I'd like to now welcome on the stage panelists on the, of the next panel called Energy Security First, Pragmatic Decisions Affecting Climate Ambitions. Please welcome on stage Kyriakos Kakouris, Vice President of the European Investment Bank. <laughs> Sebastian Lume, Executive Manager and Co-Founder of Brussels Institute for Geopolitics. Rana Nedela, Deputy Minister, Ministry of Industry and Trade, Czech Republic. <laughs> Marilena Rauna, Deputy Minister for European Affairs, Republic of Cyprus. <laughs> and Georg Zachman, Senior Fellow from Brüchel. <laughs> the moderator of this section will be Kostis Geropoulos from INI Global Media. Please take your seats. And before we start our discussion, let me now welcome uh, on the stage uh, Director General of Nuclear Energy Agency, William D. McWood IV, who will deliver his keynote speech that will open our discussion. Mr. Director General, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. I feel like we should just bring everybody closer to the podium because we, we've lost a few people in the coffee room. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here because I've seen what your discussion has been over the last um, several hours. Uh, very impressive line of conversation, very important issues, and um, I'm somewhat jealous I haven't had the time to sit and listen to your conversations because I think it, it would have been quite interesting. Um, first, I will um, perhaps surprise many of you by telling you that I am not a European. Obviously, I'm an American, and but I live in Paris um, because that's where the Nuclear Energy Agency is located. I've been there for about a decade. Um, so I have certainly have seen a lot of Europe over the last uh, 10 years. But I, I will say that I am from a part of the U.S. where people know what a pierogi is. So that gives me some basis to have a conversation with you. Um, and that's actually quite relevant, because where I'm from in the U.S., I'm from, a, I'm from the city of Pittsburgh. You probably have heard Pittsburgh. And you know, in, in where I come from, it was the heart of the steel industry in the U.S. And uh, when I was growing up, when I was a child, the steel industry was the biggest employer. Um, everybody had relatives that worked in the steel mills or, or support. And during the 1970s, late 70s, that started to change. And you started to see the decline of that industry. Um, foreign competition, changes in technology, uh, changes in economics, and you started to see mills closing uh, throughout the area. And it really was um, a shock, a sociological shock. And what I, re what I remember thinking about this over the years is that um, at that time, when I was growing up, and you had people who worked in the steel mills, um, someone who worked in the steel mill made a, an income and, a, and, a, and a, enough of a living to put their children through college. Today, that level of skill, you know, high school graduates without any college training, um, they can't put people, their kids through college. They can't afford it. They can barely afford to house and feed their families if they don't have higher education. It's very, very difficult unless they have a skill that they can market. That's a sociological change, um, where labor isn't enough anymore. And what we have seen where I grew up is that 
There are small towns and communities around Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is largely recovered, but Pittsburgh has moved on to high technology and medical technology and all sorts of things. So Pittsburgh is doing okay, but the small communities around Pittsburgh, where the steel mills used to be located, largely have never entirely recovered. And the statistics out of these places are dismal. Long-term unemployment, um, people who um, who have um, drug addiction issues, um, hopelessness, and and when you when you look at what these people think about the society, they think that the government has basically forgotten they exist, that people don't care what happens to them, and these people are the people that most likely will vote for populist politicians. And when I see the results of elections in Europe, I think about that because I hear a lot of um, you know, policymakers and media people saying, you know, this is either the right thing or the wrong thing to do, depending on your point of view. But I think of it in a very personal way because I remember these people that I grew up with and I think why would they vote for the same people that put them in the position they are today? Now, that doesn't mean I'm making a judgment about who's right or who's wrong, but, I, but just looking at it from the standpoint of those people in these communities, why would they vote for the same people that they've been voting for for the last 30 years? Because their, their situation has gotten worse, it hasn't gotten better. And then you fold in this other conversation about meeting the climate challenge. And when you talk to people in these communities about climate change, um, it's real, their point of view is very dismissive. They, they, couldn't, they honestly couldn't care less. They, don't, they aren't interested in listening to it. They only care about you know, what, how do they feed their families? Is there, are their children going to be able to go to college? Are their children going to have a better life than they did? Um, and so as time goes on and you see that the challenge in the public sphere of communicating about climate change gets more and more difficult almost every year, um, and you wonder why. And a lot of it is because the story of climate change has been a story of politicians telling ordinary people in one way or another that some level of sacrifice is needed, that some increased costs are needed to pay more for fuel, more to heat your house, more for everything. And, and then again, you wonder, why are they rejecting that message? So for those of us that think that climate change is a significant issue that we have to deal with, that we have a responsibility to manage for the future, it's obvious that the story of sacrifice, of giving up Western civilization, in effect, um, to save the environment is a lost cause. That is not going to convince the public around the world to join the fight to reduce CO2 emissions. It simply isn't. And on top of that, you have people in developing countries. You know, I've, I've visited countries in Africa recently, um, a couple of times last year, and you know, they are, they, they're at the policy level, they're very interested in me helping to deal with climate change, but the reality is they have to feed people. They have to bring people out of poverty. Um, they would like to help with climate change, but they aren't going to sacrifice the development of their societies to save the environment. So all this is really to be said that we need to have a path where policymakers, industry, NGOs have to be able to present a path to the public where we can save the environment and still maintain economic development and growth. If we don't do that, it's, it's all over. It's hopeless. They will not support it. They will not vote for politicians who support it. And you will see that we will fail in any attempt to reduce CO2 emissions. So that's why I think the conversation that we have been having around the world, and particularly in Europe, about the future of energy is so important. It's a matter of 
dealing with that question of how do you have economic growth in a, in a, in a carbon constrained world and how do you at the same time assure that you have a secure supply of energy in a world that's become much much more complex from a geopolitical standpoint and the answer that many countries have arrived at is nuclear energy obviously um, now, for those of us who've been saying that nuclear can play these roles for a long time, I, I don't think I get any particular satisfaction seeing countries like Netherlands or Belgium or Italy or others um, changing policies and coming um, back into this nuclear conversation um, because I recognize that every country has to make its own decision on some basis. They have to do their own analysis, make their own political decisions, and that's sometimes meant that nu nuclear made sense for them, and sometimes it didn't. And that is their, their choice and their, their volition. But now that they have come back into this conversation, we also recognize that they're coming to the conversation, and we collectively, as an international community, are coming back to this conversation very, very late in the process. If we had been at this stage 15 years ago, I would be able to say, if this were 15 years ago, that I'm absolutely confident that we can reach net zero by 2050. But the reality is that 2050, in most instances, is just around the corner. You know, 2024 is already over, so basically we're talking about 25 years of 2050. In terms of the infrastructure that we're talking about replacing, in terms of the technologies that have to come into play, in terms of the people that need to be trained, that's very, very little time to act. So the urgency is immediate. It is here today. And the reality also is that while a lot of people like to say that failure is not an option, failure is probably more likely than not at this point. Because of, the, because of the time frames involved and the difficulty of the change we're talking about. There are some bright spots here. We are seeing countries, particularly countries like Czechia, that have made the decision to move forward, to deal with the fact, yes, there are uncertainties, yes, there are questions, but that if we're going to provide energy for our future economy, for the future of our societies, um, we're going to have to make some choices. And some of those choices might be difficult, but we're going to make them. That is something that is should be emulated by many, many countries. Even um, in my home country, in the U.S., I'm watching power companies dither over whether to build new nuclear or not. They will tell you privately, the executives, that they have reached the conclusion that there's really no viable alternative to building large nuclear if they're going to both maintain energy security and deal with climate change. They will tell you that privately, almost universally. But publicly, they won't say it because they're worried about what stockholders are going to say, they're worried about what their boards are going to say, and they're worried about how do they manage the uncertainties. The choice is going to be taken out of their hands soon because if we don't start building things very soon, we're not going to have the lights on, and that's not going to be acceptable. So we are reaching a point where the option to put the decisions off, to defer it to, to, an, to another time, we're losing those options. If you are working towards a better future, that future is right in front of you right now, right here. And there are many significant challenges to deal with. Last year, for the first time, we had a ministerial meeting on the subject of how to pave the way for expanded nuclear construction. We had 20 ministers from countries around our membership that came together to have a conversation with CEOs about what are the challenges, and how do we deal with them, and how do we deal with them quickly? The major challenges that came out of that conversation, number one is how to finance all of this nuclear construction. It's the biggest single thing that came out of the conversation. And in parallel with your conference today, there's another conference taking place not far from here 
on nuclear financing, which I actually have to run back to to do the closing remarks. So that's why I can't stay with you uh, the rest of the, the afternoon. The second issue that came up was the supply chain. Now, this, this will be a very esoteric issue to many of you, but nuclear power plants are composed of thousands and thousands of different parts, valves and pumps and piping and all sorts of electronics. And each one of those parts has to meet certain quality standards. And if you have suppliers that say they can meet those quality standards and provide your parts, and then you start your project and you discover halfway through that they actually don't know how to do it, that's a huge problem. And if that sounds far-fetched, that's exactly what's happened in almost every nuclear power plant built in the Western countries in the last 20 years. We can't let that happen again. So we have to deal with this issue of supply chain. The third issue that the ministers and the CEOs identified was the human capacity. There are not enough engineers and scientists to do what we say we want to do in a nuclear field. We had 24 countries sign a declaration at COP28 calling for tripling of nuclear capacity around the world. We don't have the people right now. And so one of the big issues that we will be dealing with over the next several years is how do we get more engineers and scientists um, to, to provide the talent we're going to need to build and operate these plants. We held a workshop in Romania um, just last year that was actually quite interesting. We have, a, we have a collective of universities that we work with from around the world. And the, this group held this workshop in Romania because Romania has said that they need to triple the number of nuclear engineers in their country to meet their objectives for the future. And when the conversation started, um, I knew we were going to get to the usual academic conversation. Well, we need more laboratories, we need more classrooms, we need more professors. And we did have that conversation. But ultimately, the conversation shifted very quickly to something that was a bit of a surprise to me. And that was the recognition that came from a lot of the professors that were there, that there just aren't enough students there aren't enough children coming through the system to supply the number of engineers that we're talking about, the way things are today. In OECD countries, the birth rates are way down. There aren't as many children. And as within that context, fewer children go into the hard sciences, engineers and scientists, than, used, than did in the past. So you have a very, very small stream of scientists and engineers coming into the future. This is a huge problem, not just for the nuclear sector, but really for the entire industrial sector. It's, it's, it's actually, could be the one thing that, we, that proves to be most difficult to fix. We are going to try to fix it, nevertheless. You know, that's, we're very arrogant at the NEA. We think we can fix any problem. Um, so we do have a new initiative to try to um, communicate with people at the pre-college level and encourage more children to go into science and technology and stick with it and some of those will become nuclear engineers and scientists, and that will help in our sector. But that's, that's also um, a long-term issue. But if we don't have a workforce in place, by about, say, 2035, um, there's no way we'll be able to meet the objectives we set for ourselves. So all these issues are very important. And there's probably other issues as well that we could go into, but those are the three principal issues that we spend time on. And um, we're going to have another one of our ministerial meetings this summer, uh, this, this September. Um, we're expecting to have CEOs and ministers from around our member countries come together. And, and in this meeting, we're really going to work with them to see where the common cause is. Where can we get collectives of member countries together to not simply talk about these issues, but actually to solve these issues. And I've, it's been a big part of my conversation here today. Um, I met with Minister Sekula of the, um, of, of the Ministry for um, in, Industry and Trade. If I got that wrong, please excuse me. I always get these acronyms wrong. Um, and we had a very good discussion about this. But the truth is that whatever decisions we make when it comes to dealing with these, these issues, we have to recognize that there's some basic facts one of those basic facts is we have to build something. 
we have to build something very quickly. And the first of these plants in the nuclear field that we will build, and I think some of the first will actually be here in Czechia. They won't necessarily be easy to build because we haven't done this in a long time. So we have to be ready for that, and we have to be recognized that this is a long-term battle to deal with our, our economy, economic challenges, our um, energy security challenges, and of course the climate challenge. Now that, sound, that may sound like I'm a pessimist. I'm not. I'm actually an optimist. I think we can solve these problems. But if we don't work together, we won't be successful. Working together, I'm absolutely convinced, is the key to solving these big issues. Countries have to be able to work together. We are now focusing on like-minded countries that are moving in the same direction, want to solve these problems, want to do it the right way, and if we work together, we can be successful. Because if we don't work together, failure isn't just an option. Failure could be a reality. So our collective success is something I think we can achieve. And if we don't do that, then we'll have collective failure. So um, as you continue with this summit, um, I congratulate you on having this discussion. Um, I hope I've given you a few things to think about as you go forward, because these are critical, important issues. Um, where the energy comes from, how we get the energy, is really the essence of economic growth and ultimately social freedom, um, both in Europe and around the world. And it starts with discussions like this. Thank you very much for your attention and look forward to working with all of you to bring the future about in the right way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Markwood, uh, for this is very inspiring keynote uh, presentation and uh, speech. Um, as you mentioned, uh, meeting the climate goals, uh, but we also have to have a secure uh, supply of energy. And um, we have a very a new geopolitical realities and challenges to face. So um, this is a very good lead way into the, the next panel because we have a very um, expert panel here um, from uh, the, IE, the European Investment Bank. We have two uh, uh, politicians. We have the think tanks. So it would be very interesting to have, uh, you know, moving into um, our panel discussion about uh, energy security first, pragmatic decisions affecting climate ambitions in this new uh, geopolitical reality and how we can have energy security but at the same time have a green transition strategy in the new uh, landscape. Um, just to remind you uh, about our panel, I mean, it was introduced in the beginning, but uh, we have uh, Kiriakos Kakouris, who's the VP from the European Investment Bank. We have Rene Nedella, who's the Deputy Minister from the Minister of Industry and Trade in the Czech Republic. Uh, Marilena Raruna, who's the Deputy Minister for the European Affairs from Cyprus. Um, Sebastian Lumet, who is the executive manager from the Brussels Institute of Geopolitics, and Georg Zachmann, who is a senior fellow from Bruegel. Um, I'm going to start with a few, um, we're going to start with like a few just introductory remarks from all the speakers, and then I'm hoping to have a good um, uh, uh, dialogue between the speakers, and also you can pose your questions uh, with Slido, just scan the code, and I'll have, uh, I have the here the, um, the little tablet, I can uh, ask the speakers for you. Um, Kiriakos, I'm going to start with you first, uh, if you, for a short statement, um, about, uh, you know, introduction to the European Investment Bank as a EU financial arm, uh, and how sustainable sector is a very key pillar of your financing. Thank you, Costas. Thank you very much. Let me start by, by thanking the organizers, the Prague, uh, the Prague European Summit, for convening such an important forum. And uh, thanks also to the Czech Ministry of Foreign Affairs for hosting us in this um, beautiful um, building. It's my second time. I was here also two weeks ago for 
having a meeting with the deputy minister, I'm, every time I'm really impressed. Uh, from, I, I start from the last of what uh, our keynote speaker said, that we have to, uh, to work together. And uh, we, the European Investment Bank, the bank uh, of, uh, of, of the EU states, where, 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 uh, we, we are working together with the Commission and also with the member states in order to achieve our own goals. We are the financial uh, arm of, uh, uh, of the EU, and we are a, pow a powerful instrument to deliver EU priorities both inside and outside EU. We are putting uh, Europe's capital to work, and especially in the, in the sustainable energy sector. The reason is not only that the energy sector is key has a key role to play in order to, to deal uh, uh, with the global warming and the target to keep it uh, less than 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. But in addition with, uh, uh, with the invasion of, of Russia to Ukraine and uh, has shown us that uh, 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 decarbonizing our energy system is more urgent than ever. Uh, to achieve uh, goal climate, uh, to achieve uh, global uh, climate goals, energy, energy security, we will need massive investments in energy efficiency, renewables, electricity networks, and innovative technologies such as floating offshore wo uh, wind, uh, battery storage, low carbon hydrogen, and uh, etc. And uh, we are here uh, as EIB to support the member states in this effort. Uh, as EIB, we probably you already know us, we called ourselves for few, uh, almost um, 10 years uh, now as, as a EU climate bank, and more of 50% of, of our investment is in uh, contributing to climate action. Over the past, the last 10 years, we have channeled uh, around uh, 108 billion euros uh, inside and outside the the EU energy sector for clean energy projects, uh, and this is this investment you can see very important now. The, after the Russian invasion and the, when the Russian gas supply it was really reduced, uh, and this is the significance of this investment. Uh, last year alone, in 2023, more than 20 billion euros uh, through uh, the Repower EU and EU initiative. Initiative designed to reduce Europe's dependence on uh, of fossil fuel oil and accelerate grid transition. Uh, the electricity generation capacity finance uh, uh, will be able to power 13.8 million uh, households. Additionally, SEIB we have increased uh, this target because it was uh, so successful from 13 billion to 45 billion, and uh, the program goes until. Uh, 2027. These additional funds will be directed to renewables, energy efficiency, green storage, uh, electric vehicles, uh, charging infrastructure, and breakthrough technologies such, such as uh, carbon uh, uh, hydrogen. Yeah, definitely. Um, the EIB, um, are, are, you know, it's so important in the EU member states, and especially as you mentioned in decarbonizing. Uh, is more important than ever, but at the same time, you know, um, also making sure there's a s stable supply of energy. Um, now uh, I'm going to uh, Rene Nadella, um, who, you know, is the Deputy Minister of um, uh, Industry and Trade in, uh, here in the Czech Republic, and I mean, it's very competitive industry, so. Uh, uh. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kostis, uh, and also, Thank you, Megwood, for your speech and for cooperation with uh, Nuclear Energy Agency. Uh, and, and thank you, you know, for inviting me here. Uh, firstly, I would like, you know, to highlight the Czech Republic situation, you know. Uh, we are now uh, preparing uh, the revision of state energy strategy uh, and also national energy climate plan. Uh, uh, we would like, you know, to read the energy climate targets uh, we would like to keep uh, security of supply. Uh, we would like to keep social peace, uh, as William mentioned, because you know this is very important. Because 
all new investments will need, you know, uh, additional costs, you know, and who will pay for that, you know, customers or member states or who we need to find the proper, uh, proper solution for, uh, for this. Uh, but sometimes I think that uh, nobody is thinking about the industry and to keep, you know, the, the industry, and not just only Czech industry, but European industry competitor. Because if uh, the industry will not be profitable, uh, then for sure we cannot uh, put them new targets because they will not have money for uh, new targets, for saving uh, uh, for these, uh, these targets. So uh, I think that this will be also main task you know, for, the, for the European Commission, uh, uh, how to set you know, 2040 targets, but how to keep uh, well-functioning uh, energy market and how to keep uh, competitive uh, industry, not just only in Europe uh, against US or against China, but to keep uh, industry uh, in Europe. That's my, you know. Uh, Thanks, and, uh, and uh, you make a good point. I mean, you have to at the same time uh, keep it functional, but also keep uh, the social peace in the terms of you know having the financing and keeping it competitive. Um, Marilena Arauna, I mean, as you, as a deputy minister of uh, European Affairs, I mean, you have the um, upcoming uh, EU presidency uh, in the first term of 2026. Um, you know, I mean, as energy transition and the security is definitely going to be one of those issues. Uh, if you can uh, start, with and we can talk. Thank you, more. thank you, Gottfried. Uh, let me uh, also start by first and foremost thanking uh, the organizers. Uh, for, for the invitation, the Institute of International Relations, the European Institute, uh, for this um, very valuable summit and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for, for hosting it. Uh, I see it as a, um, as a really timely uh, dialogue and exchange of views uh, on one of the key challenges we face as European Union, that of energy uh, security. And I see this also as fitting into the discussion uh, in Brussels about how we approach this issue uh, and the solutions. Um, the, uh, the speech by our keynote speaker uh, really framed uh, uh, the, the points I want to make as well, uh, in particular two, uh, two issues that he raised. One, that the future is right in front of us. And the second, that uh, we need to work together. And I will approach this issue from uh, a European and regional perspective, because Cyprus is the member state of the European Union that is also an integral part of the Eastern Mediterranean, of this very important neighborhood for the European Union and the world. Our discussion is timely, uh, first because it comes right after the European elections, and also ahead of a very important European Council that will take place on the 17th next week, uh, where the strategic agenda of the European Union uh, will be held, the first discussion, where the dimension of defense and security and energy security uh, is an integral part of that, uh, will be discussed. Let me start by saying that um, the European Union at this moment is at what I consider to be an inflection point uh, in its history. It has had to face numerous challenges in recent years. We started with you know, the, the economic crisis, we had the, the migratory crisis, the pandemic, we had Brexit, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and most recently, war on the other side of our border uh, in the Middle East. And through it all, I think it's important to remember that despite the serious challenges we've had, and we have to be honest, that there have been very challenging moments with regards to uh, unity in the European project in this crisis, I really believe that the EU has delivered. But it ha we have come at a point in our evolutionary journey uh, as a European Union where we need to make bold decisions about the future we want for Europe. And the time to make that decision is now, it's in our hands. And we need to put down the building blocks for a stronger and more secure European Union, a more resilient European Union, a more competitive European Union, and we have a very important report coming up, uh, the Draghi report that will be submitted uh, in June. We are talking a lot about a more strategically autonomous European Union, 
and also about a greener and fairer union that is closer to its citizens. Uh, and this is really the discussion right now in Brussels on the strategic agenda. And a more secure and strategically autonomous union is inextricably linked uh, to energy security. Uh, it, was it has been mentioned numerous times uh, today that the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also the war in the Middle East and the developments we are seeing as a result in the Red Sea, they have appended our energy markets. They have led to price volatility and energy insecurity across the world with serious repercussions on the EU's energy system. And as a result of that, the European Union and member states are dynamically, I believe, reshaping their energy strategies to reflect and respond to these geopolitical uh, realities and secure uh, their energy supply. And part of this equation is, this, is making this acceleration towards clean energy, um, uh, more, uh, which is more imperative. It is a challenging course, but it, we must stay the course. Uh, because more uh, energy security means more energy independence for the European Union, and as a result, a stronger and more geopolitical uh, Europe. Um, now, a couple of words on where I see Cyprus uh, in this, uh, in this <coughs> map. Cyprus is the only EU member state that is in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, region that has confirmed gas reserves. Uh, between Cyprus, Israel, and Egypt, there are more than 2,200 BCMs of natural gas that have been discovered since the 2009 Tamar discovery. And of those, around 600 BCMs are estimated to be available uh, for export. The presence of energy giants in the Eastern Mediterranean and in the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, such as ExxonMobil, such as ENI, Todal, uh, to name a few, are really testimony to the potential uh, of this region. Um, and they could also be, th these, um, these companies and these reserves could be leveraged to create the synergies uh, that we need for a sustainable regional uh, gas market that could also supply uh, the European Union with gas in the immediate future and with hydrogen um, in, the, in, the, in a few years' time. In this, in this journey, uh, and we can discuss it more uh, during our, uh, our discussion later, we have really worked on building um, uh, synergies and creating a web of cooperation with Cyprus, Greece, and countries of the region that really were triggered by energy, uh, by the energy uh, sector. And we are having interconnection projects that are significant, such as the Great Sea uh, interconnector, which is a project of geostrategic uh, importance. We also have the East Med uh, pipeline, and we also have, for example, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum that was formed between Cyprus, Egypt, France, Greece, Israel, Italy, Jordan, and Palestine. And so, for us, the Eastern Mediterranean region and Cyprus, an EU member state that is an integral part of the, of the region, could have a key role to, to play in constructing um, uh, the European Union's energy security. Thanks so much, Marilena. And for, um, indeed, we had in, uh, in Greece uh, the East Mest Gas Forum a, a couple of weeks ago, and we visited uh, the LNG terminal there. I mean, it is very important to have um, a safe supply of energy, um, and but at the same time, as you mentioned, you know, to create a more uh, sustainable, greener future. Um, and have a strong, um, uh, you know, fair, geopolitically strong EU. Um, you know, the Draghi report, as you mentioned, uh, is coming up soon. But there was another report. Uh, that there, was a um, there was another report uh, recently from uh, Sebastian Lumet from your Brussels Institute for Geopolitics, and um, you know, it discussed, uh, you know, the about the energy diplomacy and Europe's uh, new strategic mission. Um, Sebastian. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here. I mean, a lot has been said already uh, by, by the speakers, so to kind of continue the conversation indeed, uh, I would like to mention a couple of key takeaways from, uh, from the, the report which you, you kindly mentioned. 
uh, and which I think in a way can help make sense uh, of how the European energy security context uh, has profoundly changed and how, what are some of the consequences of that. And I think this can be summed up in a way in three broad ideas. The first idea is that energy security is the priority. The war in Ukraine showed that basically no market-based rulebook could shield Europeans uh, from their biggest energy supplier simply turning off the taps. And I think that uh, this reminded us of something very concrete, is that energy security comes first and foremost. I mean, for years, EU policymakers uh, aimed for a balance between the triple goals of affordable, secure, and sustainable energy, and all three remain perfectly valid and important, but the war kind of clarified this trilemma. Ultimately, now we know that our states and societies are willing and able to pay up uh, for whichever energy source they can uh, lay their hands on um, when needed. And the rest of the world certainly took notice uh, of this vulnerability of ours as well. So strategic planners should and will factor this as they draw up plans for domestic energy production and international partnerships in the future. Second, the renewable revolution is a great opportunity, but it brings new dependencies. I mean, the fundamental difference uh, with the green transition from previous energy transitions uh, is that this one is not anymore an addition of layers to the energy mix, so going from coal to coal plus oil, etc. Now it requires a rapid and large-scale shift to clean energy and simultaneously phasing out fossil fuels. And this uh, will change and has already changed uh, energy and power dynamics within Europe. And of course, nuclear is a very good illustration of the tensions that uh, come with that. But notwithstanding those political cleavages that remain and will remain among, uh, among member states on the path, the best path to this transition, uh, this shift overall is an opportunity for us collectively to become more energy independent than we have ever been since the age of coal. That's great. But at the same time, although the reliance on foreign suppliers will decrease substantially, it will not end. So green autarky is and should remain an illusion. The green transition will come with its new own set of dependencies, notably, of course, on China, which dominates many critical mineral supply chains, which pose a challenge to European autonomy. So some of the diplomatic capital invested in Moscow for decades before it eventually turned into a geostrategic liability should now be spent on making and strengthening ties with a diversified set of new key energy partners of tomorrow, and that applies to fossil fuels as well as renewables. And of course, this is a major feat of uh, energy diplomacy that is much easier said than done. I mean, not all suppliers are as reliable and virtuous as Norway, and Europeans will continue being confronted with uh, unpleasant but unavoidable dilemmas in their quest to secure geopolitically stable supply lines. And this will require diplomatic influence and the willingness to adopt a more transactional approach as European, something we sometimes struggle to do. And finally, that's uh, my third point. Harnessing these new energy flows requires technology. And so geopolitically, we are transitioning away from a scramble for fuels and towards a race for green technology, which in turn is fostering a new kind of industrial policy. And in this respect, the race for green tech leadership has also turned not just China, but the United States and Europe into industrial competitors. I mean, the US has emerged as a oil and gas superpowers. Gas prices are three to five times lower than in Europe. Um, and that puts our industries at a disadvantage. Um, and I'm not even mentioning here uh, the, uh, the IRA and its, its effects on European industry. So it's vital for us not to forget that the green transition, for it to be a success for industry and for most consumers, supplies must remain affordable. And this is why uh, one of the reasons why autarky must remain an illusion, but also one reason why we need to help our industries remain competitive. And clearly, all major economies in American and Chinese strategists for sure now integrate these economic, political, and strategic considerations into their respective industrial and energy policies. And this is a sign of the state of public power being back as a key energy actor, getting involved in markets, 
capping prices, investing massively in green tech. And the EU and its member states have certainly clearly started to go down this, uh, this road. And the von der Leyen Commission, the first von der Leyen Commission at least, uh, has deployed a plethora of industrial policy uh, initiatives which have also affected energy policy. But at this stage, we remain still ill-equipped to go beyond ad hoc responses uh, set in motion by the pressure of events. And certainly, there is no coordinated union-wide strategy that is deployed yet. So we will need a more robust and comprehensive strategic approach, which encompasses energy policy, uh, diplomacy, industrial policy, but also brings much more coherence between the clout and resources uh, of classic diplomacy that mostly lies within national governments with uh, initiatives such as uh, Ms. Pauna just, uh, just mentioned, and which there are plenty of, which is a, an amazing thing, um, but also with uh, the regulatory and financial means uh, of Europe's industrial and energy policy that also lie uh, in Brussels. So maybe we can go back to this uh, afterwards. <coughs> Thanks so much, Sebastian. And um, I'd like to conclude the, the, the opening <coughs> statements before we go to discussion with uh, Georg Zachman, who's a senior fellow from Bruegel. And um, yeah, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about so much is like electrification as well, which uh, I know you mentioned as the new oil opportunity. Um, uh, Georg, if you want to... Um, Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Kostis. Uh, so I will try to make uh, three points. Uh, the first one is electricity is set to become the new oil. So the second point is we need to deal with Russian gas, even so currently there is not much of a problem. And the, uh, and the third point is Ukraine is the major energy battleground uh, at di in this year at least. Um, let, me, uh, let me start. Um, with electrification, that is foreseen in, in essentially all of the scenarios as the major way for decarbonization, we will see significantly less import dependence. As Sebastian mentioned that, and I also am much less concerned about all these uh, critical raw materials or uh, PV panels. I think for that, these are investment goods, they can be stored, they can be produced here. It's much less of an issue than it used to be with fossil fuels. So I think we have a great opportunity here. We have, however, new challenges from electricity for energy security, which is underinvestment. And we have seen that in the past decade, uh, that underinvestment in the electricity sector is a massive problem and challenges our also competitiveness and hybrid attacks. And if you get a, to a fully electrified system, we have a system with essentially a single point of failure. If our electricity system collapses, we have no heat, we have no transport, we have no nothing. And that is going to be critical, and we need to find solutions for this, uh, for this all-electric world to securitize that. Security in a new all-electric world will come from effective markets. We have seen during the energy crisis that France lost half of its nuclear power plants and was saved by the rest of Europe, that Germany lost half of its gas supplies and was saved by the rest of Europe, and uh, that Spain and, uh, and Portugal lost a lot of their hydro production and they are still able to, uh, to, to function because of uh, energy exchanges. So the internal market is an extremely performant tool for, uh, um, uh, for security and coordinated planning should become the norm. We currently don't have that. You mentioned the NECPs. How often is Germany mentioned in a Czech NECP? How often is the Czech Republic mentioned in a German NECP? Way too little. We talk too little to each other about our plans. Um, so profound cross-border integration we need. I think we need a form of European energy agency. Currently, we rely on an energy agency that sits in uh, uh, where the US and Japan sit on the, on the top of the agency. And we have little own visibility uh, of what we, are, what we are doing. And we need a new electricity market 2.0 that is ready for 90% uh, decarbonized electricity. Um, political question, and that is where I think I, uh, I can steer the pot quite a bit, is where will we produce and where will we consume electricity? The new forms of electricity are produced where there is sun and wind or maybe a little concern about nuclear. This might not be in the areas where we used to have a lot of coal in the past. And the question is, are we trying to outsource our electricity intensive industry abroad? Are we trying to outsource it within our countries, for example in Germany from the Ruhr to the coast, or are we trying to or allowing 
outsourcing within the European Union to have the benefit of competitiveness and of security at the same time. Um, on the second point, very briefly, gas contracts with Russia are still partly in place. Um, we don't have sanctions on Russian gas. If Russia opens the taps, we have no methodology to stop that. Investors are worried that this might happen again. We need a European sanction regime. The key to Russian gas needs to be locked somewhere in Brussels, and each of the member states needs one number of the 27-digit code. Um, and the, uh, the last point is on, uh, on Ukraine. Last two days I was at Ukraine Recovery Conference in Berlin. Uh, we did a paper and present a paper there on the situation for next winter. They most likely will have about five hours of, uh, of power cuts every day for the, uh, for the next 12 months uh, if nothing more is being destroyed. Um, the problem is like at a traffic accident, five people are standing around the, the victim and everybody thinks all the others are better suited to help them. And we need to, to move extremely quickly. We need air defense, we need repairs to the system with, uh, with used materials and, and new stuff. We need to bring and push transmission capacity. So we need to push Poland, we need to push Slovakia, we need to push Hungary to make as much transmission capacity available to, to Ukraine. We need to bring them gas peakers and potentially some renewables and, uh, and batteries will, will help. If we don't get that, we might have a new wave of, uh, of uh, refugees over the winter and it will drastically uh, undermine the cohesion of the Ukrainian society that will fight about the last amounts of electricity that they have in the through their system. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much, um, Georg. And um, now, uh, as we proceed on uh, the more the discussions uh, stage of our panel, um, Again, I want to remind you, I mean, I've already started being receiving uh, your questions through Slido. I have a few questions of my own, but I also encourage the speakers to, uh, you know, interact uh, with each other. And, you know, if, you, if something comes up, you know, please feel free to also comment on it. Uh, one of the questions that came in, actually, was um, after um, Rene's uh, statement. And this is a follow-up to, to Rene's statement, is that what we need to keep our industry competitive and what measures should uh, the EU take to achieve this? And I wanted to start with um, uh, Kiriakos because, you know, you have a lot of, we are in here in the Czech Republic and, uh, you know, the European Investment Bank has quite a few uh, activities in this sector. And um, I was wondering, I mean, specifically for the Czech Republic, but also, you know, um, in Europe, I mean, what are the areas or priorities, uh, you know, for the bank's lending and to, to uh, under their green transition? Czechia in uh, Czechia. Actually, I like Czechia <laughs> better than the old <laughs> name. We were president of Czechia since 1992, and uh, we provided loans of up to 30 million. Last year, uh, Over the past few years, the EIB Group has worked to make financing business uh, sustainable. Uh, here in, uh, in Czechia, we, last year, uh, we invested 1.88 billion euros, and from that, 75 percent was uh, uh, for financing climate-relevant uh, projects. Uh, also, in Czechia, uh, supported the energy projects. Uh, during our general effort to back uh, energy security and sustainability. For example, uh, the city of <coughs> Brno borrowed uh, 75 million uh, from the EIB to upgrade the heat uh, generation and distribution system. The, the loan also will um, uh, enable the municipality to, to construct uh, a heat and power uh, plant fuel by wood chips. Uh, additionally, we have uh, finance and logistics uh, property developers and uh, managers in, in real estate uh, uh, facilitate the, roll, uh, the rollout of solar panels in industry and buildings in, uh, in countries of the area, including including here. Uh, we also cooperate with uh, local funds uh, in, in their financing for uh, uh, green tech uh, in Czechia, uh, but also across Europe. 
And it, it, uh, at the EIB, we also, uh, except of financing, we provide uh, technical assistance under our flagship uh, program, ELENA. Uh, we are cooperating with the National Development Bank of, uh, of uh, the local National Development Bank, uh, NRB, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, the Central Bohemia Region, many projects that are, are going along. Uh, Rene, you want to add something? Yeah, I would like, you know, to highlight the, the ELENA program, you know, it's, this technical assistance is very useful and we use, you know, this uh, in energy efficiency sector, my colleagues, you know, from the, from the energy, energy efficiency. Uh, and, you know, when we are talking about the industry, I would say, you know, that the industry is facing, you know, three main, I would say, paths. First is, you know, that they have targets, you know, renewable targets, energy efficiency targets, hydrogen targets, and et cetera. That's, that's one, uh, one path. Uh, second path uh, is uh, ESG, you know. Uh, they would like, you know, to make their product, you know, uh, environmental, social, uh, responsible, and, and, and et cetera, you know, that they would like, you know, to sell uh, these pro products. Uh, and, the l and the last part is necessary cost, additional, additional cost, and who will pay it? If we will put, you know, this additional cost, you know, to uh, industry sector, then their products will be not uh, competitive, and they will not sell their products. If we will put it on a uh, state budget, uh, then the state will need to increase the taxes because they will need the money, you know, for cover these costs. And again, we are, I would say, you know, in a big problem. So, so, so the, the, the key point is how to find the proper balance, you know, between these three, I would say, tasks and how to find, you know, the proper way, you know, that we will split it, I would say, reasonable, you know, all uh, each, um, market participants, you know, that the result will be uh, for both sides, I would say, acceptable. Yeah, and I see a question here, uh, how long it will take for the EU to fully change this energy system into a green one? But as yeah, Marilena, as you mentioned, you just had uh, the European Parliament elections. I mean, uh, we're going to have a new commission soon. And um, how, how do you see this, uh, the green agenda evolving uh, during this new parliament and new commission? I mean, Definitely, the, the, you know, the implementation of some changes. Uh, the European election uh, results, I think, sent uh, some signals uh, in the member states. They sent some signals uh, in, in in Brussels. Um, I think the next Europe, the next Commission, will try to find the right balance with regards uh, to the green transition uh, strategy. On the one hand, I think that the, <coughs> the goal of ma making Europe the first um, climate neutral continent by 2050, which has been the, the kind of uh, expressed uh, uh, objective and priority, uh, it has already, we have to bear in mind that it has already been embodied uh, in EU legislation. Um, we, we cannot really take a step backward uh, on, the, on the overall uh, goal. Uh, this also has to do with our uh, credibility. Um, but then at the same time, I think what the most likely scenario will be uh, is that um, the, the, the implementation of the policy uh, of the past five years will continue. But I think the, the consciousness and the focus uh, on improving its, its narrative is something we, we will expect uh, to see. Um, I think we will see a focus uh, on green transition also through this lens of competitiveness. I think this will be, it's, it's, all, it's one of the three main pillars uh, of the strategic agenda, uh, competitiveness. Um, uh, and I think we, we will see a lot more of the narrative that green transition strengthens and doesn't weaken competitiveness, uh, that uh, groups such as farmers have an important role uh, to play in these goals, and we need to also listen uh, to the concerns. Um, and um, also, what, I, what, what might also happen uh, is that we might see a slight change downwards on the immediate goals for uh, targets for 2040, um, which is expected to be around 90%. But 
I, I think that for 2050, we will, uh, we will uh, remain um, uh, with where our goal is on climate um, neutrality. And another thing is that uh, we, will, we will see a focus, I think, also on um, reindustrialization of Europe, so a focus um, uh, on the industries and the need to also support uh, support the industries and uh, in this regard find the, a new balance uh, in this path uh, to green transition. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to comment about uh, you know, the after the elections, if, uh, but uh, also Sebastian, I mean, the do you have any concrete? concrete ideas about how to bolster the EU's capacity for strategic decision making um, when it comes to its energy policy and especially now you know with the new commission coming in <laughs> yes um, yeah I mean of course you have to start from the, the strategic uh, political uh, decision level in national context hierarchies within government give coherence eventually Prime Minister is here for the, the decision of, uh, of last resort in Brussels, things are much more complicated, as everybody knows. Uh, the Commission gives a certain stir uh, to a certain extent, but the highest political level of decision is the, is the Council. The Council is kind of the crisis manager par excellence, but it remains this an events-driven institution, and sometimes follow-ups are quite, uh, quite difficult. So to find a better interplay, there are some ideas, uh, some of which we put forward in the, in the report. Uh, one such idea would be to have a sort of annual discussion of strategic energy priorities where leaders would agree on a priority list of supplies and then task foreign ministers or energy ministers uh, with dividing labor uh, together among themselves but also with EU institutions, with the Commission, to meet uh, import needs. Uh, this could rely on uh, something similar as the 2022 gas platform, um, common gas uh, platform purchase uh, set up by the Commission, uh, but it could be extended to CRMs or to hydrogen and things like that. So that would give more direction. Uh, then there's more strategic convergence. We could think of the establishment of an advisory council to look at energy security in a very cross-cutting and strategic sense. This uh, advisory council could sit close to, um, to the EU Council, similarly to the National Security Council in Washington, but then on energy uh, issues. And then, as Jörg uh, uh, very rightly uh, pointed out, um, to feed such an advisory council, you would need more better analytical capacity in-house. Uh, and so setting up a center uh, for excellence uh, on energy security, providing data, uh, as part of the European Commission in collaboration with nat national energy regulators and international uh, agencies uh, is something that would be uh, also, um, we think, a good idea. It's in a similar spirit to uh, the U.S. Energy Information Administration that was created after the oil crisis uh, in 73. Um, and then, kind of more concretely, uh, where the money lies, uh, increased capacity uh, to act for the EU also means mobilizing investments. Uh, with more energy-related priorities um, for the next EU budget, like, for instance, a continental supergrid uh, for electricity, which could double uh, current co um, transmission capacities and would therefore reduce the need for uh, generation capacity. You could also help think of initiatives to help industry maintain their positions in wind turbines or heat pumps, whereas, for instance, solar, I think, uh, is a kind of a lost cause for um, European industries, but it's also less uh, strategic. And uh, when it comes to energy diplomacy and over oversee, um, oversee strategic investment, uh, securing an ambitious uh, next round of global gateway funding for the next multi-annual financial uh, framework is also something that I think would be very important because this initiative has started well and it should continue. Uh, and then more generally, you could think of some um, some ways to better committing ourselves to mutual solidarity in case of attacks on energy, cr critical energy infrastructures, um, as among Europeans building up on things like Article two, uh, 22 of the TFEU, for instance, that would allow for such a commitment uh, more generally. So those are a few of the... Uh, we have uh, a question from the French ambassador, Stéphane Kourouzat. 
He says, um, what do you think of the commission's proposal to set a new target of 90% reduction in GHG emissions by 2040 from the 1990 levels? The current goal is 55% by 2030. Uh, I don't know if it's anybody in the panel would like to take that or um, Georg, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So if you, I mean, we, sorry. So we have targets for uh, for 2030. Uh, we have a target for 2050, and now the challenge was that. Uh, um, for also setting the uh, nationally determined contributions, we need a, 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 20, uh, a 2040 target also for visibility for investments. And um, there has been a process during the last year in Brussels to, to come up with a, with, a, yeah, with a proposal for such a, such a target. And uh, if you take a strict line between 55% and, uh, and, uh, and minus 100%, you see that 90% is not exactly on this line, but is essentially seeing a faster decline than um, um, uh, uh, early on and, uh, and a slower decline later on. And the argument that has been given for that is uh, that, uh, yeah, that it reduces the, the aggregate emissions and that is fair on a, on a global sense and that it is feasible. Um, whether the, the new um, commission after the new parliament uh, Will agree with this uh, with this argument of the old commission is uh, is hard to uh, to tell. Um, my take is that the uh, that the economic analysis in uh, in this study can 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 still be looked into. So I'm not not entirely convinced that this is the uh, that this is the right number and that this is the the hill the next commission should die on or whether they should rather try to defend the the legal parts of the uh, and the in, uh, implementation of the green deal agenda rather than fighting for uh, for a new extremely ambitious set of targets because there is a risk of essentially having a sort of a stall situation where you just demand too much and then you you get nothing out of that i would have one other point if uh, if i if i may uh, also to maybe provoke a bit the Czech audience and uh, my my neighbor um, that is in uh, in terms of the um, industry um, protection. I think we now have to answer the question in the next five years to which degree we want to protect energy intensive industries uh, in the places where they are currently at. So do we want to protect steel industry, chemical industry in the rural area, in the, in the Czech basins and in, in, in southern Poland, or do we accept that some of them will leave and uh, or change their production method to uh, to less energy intensive ways and the argument of an uh, of an orthodox economist would be the world has changed there are now different energy factor prices coal is not setting the price anymore it is now the availability of wind and solar that is relevant the availability of space and that is not necessarily the comparative advantage anymore of some of the regions that I mentioned. And if we now give the amounts of energy that are available in these regions to industry, everybody else will have less energy available and uh, energy for the others will become more expensive. So you would essentially push to help an industry that is not competitive internationally uh, at the detriment of industries that might potentially be much more competitive. And you essentially block a transition that would happen towards the right direction. It's a bit like if we had in the 1950s subsidized labor in Europe to uh, keep labor intensive jobs in, uh, in textile industry, and then we would have still a competitive textile industry in Europe, but it would not create much value added because textiles have become so cheap. So therefore, I, I urge really a lot of caution to enter into a subsidy race between all European countries on who gives the most money to energy intensive industry to be the last, uh, the last man standing because that will suck off very valuable energy from all other sectors and it will overall decline the uh, security and competitiveness of, uh, of Europe. I know it's a, it's a very harsh story that I tell here but I'm, um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm worried that it needs to be discussed. Yeah, thanks. I, w I would like you know, to react because I'm sitting, I would say, on the opposite side. Uh, first of all, about the targets 20, 2040, uh, we, we think that it's not good you know, to choosing uh, a nice round number that looks good. You know, 
uh, we think that it will be better solution if the number will be based on the proper uh, impact analysis. Uh, and when when you will when you when you see you know the how uh, w what are the problems you know with the with the in industry not just only in the Czech Republic but uh, in the Europe, uh, then you can see that uh, we think that the industry will need more time you know for the for the transition. Uh, so we are saying please let's set the the number not nice. Uh, but s set it more real, you know, to reality, uh, and try to uh, help the sector, you know, to react and to find the solution, you know, how to reach the targets. Because there are sectors where still is no solution, you know, how to make the sector, for example, green. You know, uh, that's th the first point uh, about the uh, industry and choosing, you know, which industry will be good, you know that we will choose that will stay or not stay, especially in the Czech Republic, we are very industrial country, uh, still industry uh, is here, you know, glass industry and uh, chemi industry and et cetera. Uh, uh, and, and we think that uh, the better way is, you know, to, why, to, to find the way, you know, how to help them and how to keep them running. Because, for example, when we are talking about the steel, the main part of, I would say, everything, you know. So we cannot just only focus on uh, mobile phones uh, or digitalization or AI. Uh, yes, we can, or yes, we have to, but also we have to work uh, on these sectors, you know, and to help them uh, uh, how to uh, solve, this, uh, solve this problem, you know. So I have a little bit, you know, opposite meaning. <laughs> Kiriakos, in terms of uh, you know, you mentioned Czechia, also you know about nuclear energy, but also I mean in overall nuclear uh, energy, the European Investment Bank. I mean, what uh, do we have to? I mean, we had we heard that in the opening statement, um, on the keynote of Mr. Magwood. But uh, what's the bank's position? <laughs> you left the difficult one last. <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, I say difficult because I know how sensitive is the issue here in in Czechia. I was uh, the day before, uh, of yesterday, in, in, in Sofia also there, they are discussing, they were asking questions. Uh, I have to tell you, before becoming a vice president, I became a vice president of the European Investment Bank uh, and, uh, since uh, last October. Before and for 20 years, uh, I was uh, at the board of the European Investment Bank, uh, representing Cyprus, uh, since uh, Cyprus accession in 2004. And during my term uh, at the board, we did approve uh, nuclear projects, and, uh, and uh, EIP has invested many projects in, in, in the past 10 decades, including uh, research and development, uh, safety, and, uh, and the fuel cycle. A large investment was approved, uh, for example, last in December in Romania to recover uh, tritium. Uh, we must support the key technologies that can accelerate and facilitate the green transition for the future of Europe. Eligible projects uh, for the EIB include power generation, full uh, fuel cycle, waste management, safety upgrade, lifetime extension, decommissioning, and uh, research and development. This covers uh, most of the civilian nuclear chain. In the recent decades, as I said, the EIB has financed uh, uh, projects on safety upgrades, the fuel cycle, and research and development in fusion. Uh, as I said, uh, EIB since 2000 has uh, approved uh, the financing of eight nuclear uh, projects, totaling of uh, 1.5 billion uh, euros. Three safety upgrade projects in operating nuclear power uh, units in Finland, next door Slovakia, and Romania then the commissioning of a former uranium uh, mine in Slovenia, three projects to extend the capacity and improve the safety and energy efficiency of uranium uh, enrichment facilities in France, UK, and uh, Netherlands, and one nuclear uh, fusion research and development project in Italy. EIB financing may be provided if the projects are uh, technically, environmentally, 
financially and economically justified, taking into account lifetime costs associated with the project. Uh, very importantly, they also need to receive a positive opinion from the European Commission acting on, bef on behalf of Euratom. And the Euratom requirement means that only nuclear projects inside the EU are eligible uh, for EIB fi financing. Uh, of course, each uh, operation must be assessed on its own merits and approved by the EIB Board of Directors, which is uh, chaired by the EIB President and consists of representatives of the 27 EU member states and the European Commission. As our keynote speaker said, I mean, probably the last 15 years, that was the issue not that could discuss, but as I said recently, uh, the discussion already started. We only have a few minutes left, uh, and uh, we need to wrap this up, but uh, like in the previous um, years, I'd just like to go through just for one minute from every one of the speakers if there was any reaction they have from what they heard today or um, some few words of wisdom or something that, that you know, to be worked on until uh, the next um, summit. Um, I, uh, you know, but you know the most important task that you or uh, Marilena, I'm going to move down. Thank you, thank you very much, Costis. I think it would be very interesting uh, to see where we are this time next year, uh, uh, with regards to our discussion in Brussels on the strategic agenda and how far we've come on this issue uh, of energy security. What I would like to say is that the element of security, and energy security in particular, is a key component for the EU's strategic autonomy, which right now is uh, at the top of the agenda. Uh, in this path, we absolutely need to work together. There is no one solution for all and no, no one side that fits all. Um, and uh, we really need to also focus on what each member state can bring into this equation. And in this regard, the, the Eastern Mediterranean is an area of special interest for the European Union. Uh, Rene, you can go there. I would like, you know, to mention <laughs> nuclear in the Czech Republic, you know, uh, because we are a pro-nuclear uh, country and we are just only looking, you know, for the solution which will be cheap, which will be fast, uh, and we will, where we will arrange, you know, that the Czech industry will be part of this game. Uh, and this is, you know, uh, the key point which we would like, you know, to solve now. And I hope that, that the next year when we will sit here, then we can say, uh, yes, we are, you know, on the right way, you know, uh, how to reach this target. Uh, Sebastian? Yeah, no, I would just say uh, let's uh, follow uh, EU politics uh, in the coming days, especially on Monday. It's going to yeah. be quite, uh, going to give a few hints where the, the EU is headed for the next, uh, the next cycle. So let's watch it closely. And Georg? Yeah, uh, Czech diplomats have been extremely famous and, and successful in helping Ukraine uh, with, um, with ammunition by pulling together resources and that is, uh, that was ex yeah, an, a great success and I would hope that a similar success can now also be engineered in, in helping the country in terms of uh, energy supplies for the coming winter because it's also going to be decisive for the war. Yeah, that was very, um, it was great. Uh, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, we have to have be pragmatic and make the right decisions. Um, but at the same time, you know, um, deal with energy security as well as uh, climate ambitions. I want to thank all my panelists and it was really a pleasure and I really, um, thanks for participating. And I want to thank the organizers and uh, once again the Prague European Summit. Thank you.